who's hacking into homebrew. And I don't mean homebrew as in building things or, or the Wii or Xbox. I'm talking about actually making Alchema Hall. So how do you hack beer? Well, there's actually a lot of different ways that you can. So, Ben, come on, man. There we go. There's our intro screen. So you've got the delivery system that you can hack, and that's actually kind of the easiest way to get started into hacking your, your homebrew. Um, we have things called keysers, which is basically a, a, a freezer that you convert into a kegerator. You can take a refrigerator, which would be a uh, traditional stand-up, or it could be a dorm fridge, like I have in my hotel room tonight. Um, and you can make that a kegerator. And you can also do portable setups, and so we've got a few pictures about those as well. Um, so working backwards, the delivery, the next step would be the fermentation system. And so there's a, a few ways that you can kind of control your fermentation. And um, Zymo knows a hell of a lot more about the different reasons why you would want to control your fermentation process. So I'll let him expound on that quite a bit. Um, and then we have the brewing systems, um, things to not necessarily, or to not only make it easier for you to brew, but to make it easier for you to do it the same way every time. And consistency is key, and um, so we'll, we'll talk about that a bit. And then you could also hack the brewing recipes. And, you know, you could say that's just cooking, but, I mean, it is still taking what one person intended and changing it around and making it more to your liking or to however you're whatever suited for you. So I uh, went and got a few pictures off of the web of different hacks delivery system examples. Uh, you can see on the left hand side over here, this is basically just an old chest freezer. If you scour, e uh, not eBay, but Craigslist, if you keep looking at Craigslist um, for probably 30 to 45 days, you will find an old chest freezer for somewhere in the neighborhood of fifty to seventy five dollars. You can possibly even find it for less than that. Take a chest freezer, stick a little bit of wood around it, and you have something that looks like this. This is actually the same build. That's what it started at and that's what it ended up as. Perspectives look a little off because of the angles and I had to stretch, but that's that is a keyser. You can get a controller off of uh, eBay for about 25 bucks, called an STC-1000, and uh, it has a temperature probe you put inside the unit, and uh, it uh, has two relays, one for heating and one for cooling. And uh, you can actually hook a heater up into it or a cooler so that you can get a very precise temperature that you can keep everything at. Because um, a, a chest freezer would typically take everything down to a really cold temperature. You don't want to freeze your beer. You want to leave it you know, somewhere in the um, depending on which type you've got, you're probably going to want it somewhere around 40 degrees, um, maybe a little warmer, a little, uh, little cooler. Uh, so you use this temperature controller to turn the, uh, the compressor on and off at uh, whichever temperature that you want. Anything you want to say? <laughs> now, oh, so about the free samples. So first of all, you'll see that there's only two glasses up here, and there's one pitcher. Um, but everyone got a glass when they registered. So um, if you uh, answer a trivia question correctly and you expect to have anything to pour some of this uh, cider into, you need to bring your glass. And if you don't have your glass, now might be the time to go get it. Or if you have a plastic cup, I don't care. So We will not pour it directly into your mouth. It, it's, it's possible that you could spill some, and it, we're not going to let that happen. So, all right, I'm going to let you do trivia question number one. Between ales and lagers, which one has the lower fermentation temperature? So the answer is loggers. All right. 
Help yourself to two fingers and cider. So here we have some more uh, elaborate setups of the keysers for your delivery systems. Um, some people will go through and put in uh, lighting systems, um, but underneath it all, you pretty much have just a basic $50 Craigslist chest freezer. Those are the same guys that have the lights on their motorcycles, aren't they? They're probably the same guys who put lights on their motorcycles, yeah. So then you have the kegerator which is, you know, pretty much you start off with a dorm fridge. You could take an old refrigerator that's been sitting in your garage. Um, but uh, if you're going to do something new, you typically do a, a small one because form factor. Um, you, one of the things you want to look for is make sure it does not have a freezer section because if it does have a freezer section, typically it's going to cut down on the height and you can't get your keg inside of it. Um, so check those inside dimensions. The types of kegs that we use for homebrew, um, they are not the same kinds of kegs that you would get if you went down to the local party store and said, hey, I want a keg of, uh, of Newcastle or Bud or anything like that. Um, homebrew uses um, old decommissioned Pepsi and Coke kegs. So they're five gallons. Um, yeah, they're called Cornelius kegs or corny kegs. So you can also get a half corny, um, but they're very, very difficult to find, and you'll end up paying more for a half corny than you will for a corny keg, just because they're so rare. But people get half cornies because they have very small uh, kegerators that they have room to put them in. Yeah, you can put them in your yeah, you can put them in your fridge. Um, let's say you wanted to uh, take a batch and you wanted to split it and send it to multiple places, or you wanted to maybe keg half of it and bottle half of it, and then it, it's easier to do things like that. Um, or if, you know, we'll, we'll look at some of the portable um, uh, kegerator systems, and uh, let's say you didn't really have a full-time kegerator, but you wanted to have your party batch ready to take for tailgating or anything like that, then you may want to use corny ke uh, half cornies. I had two at one time. The metal was really Huh. took the fittings off and the, the threads just all started disintegrating and stuff. And they, they weren't very high quality. Mm. They were ungodly expensive. Um, hey, I think we're, we're ready for some more trivia. All right. So we already asked the question, and you're not eligible. <clears throat> we're the only ones allowed to get drunk. Um, <clears throat> off of this in, in this particular, yeah, you can get drunk anytime you want to, just not off of this. <laughs> Security? <laughs> okay, so we've already answered the question, which has a lower fermentation temperature, lagers or ales? And the correct answer was lagers. Okay, there's another key difference between lagers and ales and that would be in where the yeast does its work. So who knows the difference between lager yeast and ale yeast in terms of how it um, eats the sugar and belches out carbon dioxide? Absolutely correct. Ale yeast does all of its work on top and lager yeast does all of its work at the bottom. Okay. I know absolutely nothing about the process. So, uh, how do you how do you set up the environment to where the size is going to process all the way on top and bottom? By the yeast you put in. Yeah, the, the, the yeast itself is what makes the difference. So basically, you you open up a packet of yeast. It, you can either get dry yeast, um, which some people will just sprinkle it in. Some people will go ahead and wake it up by putting it into some room temperature water, which is kind of recommended, or you can get a, um, a yeast pack that is already suspended in liquid. Um, but either way, um, the yeast strain itself, which they're microorganisms, that's really what it is, it's bacteria. Um, but it's good bacteria because it gives us things like beer. It's beautiful bacteria. So 
uh, basically the, the DNA of the yeast is what determines where it's going to do its work. So an ale will basically live on top, and when you, when you actually put the yeast in and it starts eating up all that sugar, you'll see all of the work happening at the top, and it forms a layer called croisin, and it starts bubbling up and making, it actually looks kind of disgusting. Yeah, it looks kind of disgusting in the middle of the process. Yeah, the croisin. Um, but if you do a lager, um, it, number one, has to be at a much lower temperature, and number two, it does all of its work at the very bottom. It takes a lot longer. Yeah, much longer process. So. Results can vary. Uh, results can vary quite a bit on that, and a lot of the um, more specialized yeast, that's a sort of a trade secret, and they'll do a lot of tricks. They'll pasteurize it after they've used that yeast to get a specific characteristic into a beer. Then they'll use another yeast to bottle, if it's bottle fermented or something like that. And um, you know, it, it is possible, and there's some really interesting things you can do with that, but. You kind of have to know what beers you can get away with that with and what you can't um, because, you know, among commercial ones, they, th that can be a very, very highly guarded proprietary secret. Um, but, yes, you, it's totally doable, and you can do some really amazing things, particularly with uh, Belgian strong ales. And, and that depends from yeast to yeast. C certain yeast are more tolerant and will last a lot longer than others. Uh, it, it, it depends. I mean, in anything, anything in beer that is a, a defect is also not a defect in the right beer. Um, uh, take lambics, for example, Belgian lambics. That's all natural uh, fermented. All the yeast, bacteria as well, which is normally also a defect in beer when bacteria gets in it. They take this stuff, they put it in huge vats inside something that looks, you know, it's, it's like in a barn or something, and it's got big louvers that open up only in certain valleys and regions of Belgium. And all the little microbes float through the air and drop down into the beer. And so you've got these yeast, you've got this bacteria, all this stuff that would normally make bad beer, it would normally be a, a flaw, it would normally be terrible stuff, and it makes this incredibly delicious beer, like, like for example, their Frambois, which is the raspberry stuff. I mean, that stuff can be almost like raspberry champagne. It's, it's just unbelievable. Uh, the Crick is the cherry, which is my personal favorite of the Framboise, and, and those uh, are just absolutely off the hook, you know, so it's all you got to do is go to the right style of beer in the right place, and anything that is normally a flaw in a beer can also be a plus in the right beer done the right way. Okay. So I guess we'll get back to our, we got diverted with our, yeah, yeah, we'll get back to the slides here. We're talking about kegerators. We haven't gotten into the recipes yet. Um, so basically you take a dorm fridge, check your inside dimensions, you add some towers. You can get towers online. Um, I picked up a, uh, a two-tap tower for like 100 bucks. Um, that included all the hardware that was needed. It also included the, uh, the five-pound uh, CO2 tank that all I had to do was get filled. Um, and Actually, for 100 bucks, I think I got two kegs, two-tap uh, two tower, and the CO2 tank. I so ripped off on that guy. You need to shop around. So. I bought it at the place you told me. To. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, uh, mine included the commission from selling you yours. Yeah, that's it. Um, but typically, you can only get about two kegs in a dorm fridge. If you want to do more than two kegs at a time, that's when you need to go to the keezer. So, you know, there, the advantages of the keezer are you can fit a hell of a lot, but the disadvantage is it takes a hell of a lot more room. Um, the advantage of the kegerator is it takes a lot less room, but the disadvantage is you can only store about two, two kegs. And you can either skin it, like those examples we were showing, or you can leave it alone and just make it a refrigerator that looks like it's got a big chrome tower coming out of the top, which is pretty much what I've taken as the approach for mine, since I've hauled it to about five different freak nicks now. You can also convert furniture. 
I found this one. This was pretty cool. Yeah, so just, just take an old um, a buffet from your, uh, from your grandmother's dining room. And, uh, you know, this is a beer stein that they attach to the top of it and then put two tap handles on. And this part, they took the guts out of a small dorm refrigerator, took the entire skin of it off, and left nothing but the condensing coils and the compressor, and basically stuck it inside an area with a bunch of styrofoam insulation. And they made their own little customized grandma's antique buffet keg dispenser. About to say something? <laughs> uh, well, now this is her good silver, yeah, is what came out of this, I think. So, now, there, now we'll move into the portable keg dispensers. And so my saying here is, you don't have to be a redneck to drink beer from a trash can, but it may be a strong indicator that you are one. But, you know, actually, this is a pretty good idea. So, you know, well, it doesn't look as tasty because it's got Miller Genuine Draft, Pabst Blue Ribbon, and Old Style. <laughs> I mean, that, that's the part that makes it unappealing. But, you know, think about it. Why would you want to haul around something really heavy and that has the compressor and all this other crap in it when really you just need it for a night because you've got a bunch of buds coming over and you're going to drain it that's in, that's one, in one part. And it's, it's on wheels. All you have to do is go raid an ice machine or go down to the gas station and buy 10 bucks worth of bagged ice Fill it up around there, and you got three taps that'll last you for the entire party. I mean, you could take some spray foam insulation and cover the inside of it if you wanted a bit, little bit better, um, you know, coverage to last longer before all that ice. Just remember to cut a drain hole plug in the bottom, otherwise it'll be a pain to dump. But um, there's a lot of people that are making little uh, portable keg dispensers. Trivia time. The process whereby one takes barley and makes it into a uh, into something which will be used in beer is known as what? Bring your glass up here, sir. For a bonus pour. And can you get malted milk balls out of it? Because I love those things, man. Yeah. Oh, wait, that's mine. Oh, whoops. Oops, yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, enzymes, enzymes inside the uh, seed break down the starches inside the seed. And how do we start that process? We start it by soaking it in grain. So it's good and then? And then heat it up a little bit. So well, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll give it to you, but you also need to crack the grains first. Otherwise, the shell's a little too hard to, to get the enzymes going in there and get the water in there to make it happen. Yeah. Yep. So here's another portable kegerator. I thought this was a little bit more elegant solution. Here's one that's, again, on wheels, but it has the telescoping handle in the back. But you know, it doesn't have to be complicated, and you don't have to keep the whole keg cold, just the beer lines. I didn't find any good pictures of this, but there are so people. Um, you take a, uh, take a cooler, and you just put your lines in, and you make it go through a, a circle uh, a few times, and you just pack it. Keg doesn't even have to be cold, um, but you have your outline through the cooler. Now, you got some issues with what happens when you take gas, like CO2, that's inside of your beer, and you rapidly cool it, <laughs> then, you know, you're going it, to, it's going to get smaller, and then when you get it warmer, it's going to expand again, so it, it could create some foam yeah. like crazy. But yeah, there's some good versions. There's some really good versions of this where they have a, a piece that actually sits in here. These, it looks like the kegs are kind of sitting in it, 
Is yeah, that correct? Halfway. Yeah, they're halfway. halfway. Mm -hmm. There's some really good versions of this where you have something that's that's sort of like um, an aluminum radiator, and and the kegs sit completely outside of it, and the beer comes in through that, runs through it in the right way. We um, probably um, want to start high and then go low with it, comes back out and it's nice and cold. Those are, those are called a manifold, by the way. All right, so now we start looking at fermentation control. So next trivia question. Who can give us a why you would be concerned about your fermentation temperatures? Anybody know why it's important? Iron Geek? That's close enough. Bring the glass up. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Coke and cider. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's Heineken right there. Yeah. All right, so, so there's a couple of different reasons why you would want to control the temperature of your fermentation process. One is um, if you come up with a recipe that you really like, you want to be able to repeat it. So you want to create or recreate those conditions exactly every single time. So if you brewed a beer and it fermented at, say, 72 degrees, then you would want to make sure that it fermented at 72 degrees every time or if it fermented at 68 degrees or 65 degrees or whatever it is, you want to have consistency. The other reason is that certain yeasts perform differently based upon the temperature. You've got your profiles for your ales and you've got profiles for your lagers. As Aaron had mentioned, or as Zymo had mentioned earlier, yeah, sorry, um, you know, the uh, lager fermentation needs to happen at a much lower temperature than an ale. Anything else you want to add to that? Um, okay, so another thing is most, uh, most yeast, be it lager or ale, if they're brewed or fermented at a higher than normal temperature, they will kick uh, some off taste, as he has alluded to in bullet point number three, here, uh, you can get fussel alcohols, you can get certain fruity esters, which may or may not be something you're looking for in the particular profile of the beer that you're brewing. Uh, sometimes you intentionally brew them at a higher temperature than normal because you want them to kick fruity esters out and stuff like that for certain ales. Other times you don't want that at all. You want a clean, clear, malty taste. But there are some unusual things that you may or may not want to introduce into your beer that can happen with it. Um, when you get into higher temperatures than, than what the yeast really would like to have. And certainly the consistency thing is uh, there. That's why really, really good, and we're going to allude to, I'm going to talk about it now, but we're going to talk about it a little bit more later. Really, really good uh, fermentation chambers have ridiculous temperature control. You can stay within one degree of your set temperature uh, at any time throughout it. That's almost like the, the holy grail of making beer. It's like, you know, almost like Mr. Beer, as, as you can make it the same time after time after time after time because you can control the temperature that well. But yet yeah, you mentioned Mr. Beer, which is a very cheap... Mr. Beer like Mr. Chocolate. Yeah, not Mr. Beer as in, yeah, because friends don't let friends Mr. Beer. Oh. Um, if you'll take a look at this particular chamber here, you'll notice... Well, now you, you have to start giving up a large amount of your house square footage to do these things. Yeah, who cares? But, you know, basically they just built a room and then they padded it full of pink insulation and then they added a window air conditioner into it. So I happen to have an extra one, one and a half ton. I think it's, a, it's a one ton is what it is. I have an extra one ton window air conditioner that's just sitting down in my basement. So I'm going to actually build one of these in my crawl space because... Why not it? I've got it. Um, you know, I can add a thirty-dollar temperature controller, and I can have pretty precise control. But um, you know, 
That's a good example of it. But you don't have to go elaborate. This is somebody who didn't even decide to build the frame out of wood. They took the big sheets, the four by eight sheets of styrofoam, and they put them together with duct tape. And then their cooling source is a very small dorm refrigerator that they took the front door off of. And that's how they're cooling their, their fermentation chamber. It works. Is it the most elegant solution? No. Um, but, you know, it doesn't have to be elaborate. It doesn't have to break the bank. You can use parts that you have. That's what hacking is all about, right? It's taking a look at what you've got and figuring out how you can make things work together that weren't really thought of originally. Um, so you've got to think outside the box or, in this case, with different types of boxes. That's right. That's right. Uh, we need another trivia question. All right, so any of our former winners, if you can come up with a trivia question, you get a second sample. There we go. All right. So if anybody can explain why my partner's here, or here's name is Zymo, and what its relationship is to home brewing, you can get your sample, and you can come get yours. No, 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 you don't answer it. You came up with the question. No, but you get a you get another pour for having come up with a question. Yeah. No, he just wants a drink. You you look desperate. Come on, come on up. Come on, bring 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 a. Yeah, uh-huh, yeah, yeah. That's good. Yeah. Either that or he heard someone in front of him say something. Yeah, the, the, so the homebrew magazine is basically, well, it's Zymer and study of fermentation. So that's why he's Zymo. All right, you can have another one if you want. Like what? Free? Yeah, twist my arm. All right, so the other area where you can start to hack the beer is in your brewing rig. So as we have stated a few times, consistency is the key. You want to make it easy to replicate your process over and over and over again. So you've got several different stages to the brewing process, and you've got different ways of doing your brewing. So the one that takes the longest and is the most complicated is all grain, um, and it, it certainly takes more equipment. Uh, then you have the extract kit, which takes some of the time out of it. You still have to boil it, but you don't have to necessarily do the mashing and the um, and and extracting all of the um, the the goodness out of the grains directly. You just buy a can of of the malt that's already been created, pour it in, and then you you steep your other grains. And then you've got concentrates like Mr. Beer, which is literally just add water type of experience. Um, and as we said, friends don't friends, Mr. Beer. Um, now the other thing is That's water. How started, by the way. It's how I started too, but after one batch, I gave away my Mr. Beer. I decided, hey, this stuff almost tastes like beer. Imagine what I could do since I have a chemistry degree if I really had some good ingredients. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If I actually put some effort into this, uh, imagine how good this would taste. Because you know the 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 first batch I made, it you know it was Mr. Beer, and I'm like, well, it, it's better than a Killian's. But, you know, a lot of things are better than Killian's. So, yeah. So, you know, the other thing is water is heavy. So if you can capitalize on that and make a rigging system that lets your process flow from top to bottom, you can let gravity do a lot of the work for you. Um, so those are the most popular rigs. You've also got some that have pumps in them, but that's when you're really starting to get into the high dollar. And let me tell you, if you're getting into home brewing because you're thinking you want to save money, yeah, that's like buying a boat because you think it will cut down on your commute costs. It won't happen. It only saves money if you have unlimited amounts of time. Yeah, well, 
It would save money if you were capable of drinking more alcohol than your body would be able to process before you were 170, 180 years old. So, so here we've got some brewing rigs, and um, I actually put the caption for this on the next slide. But um, so they are. So take a look at the picture, study the picture, and then and and then read. Safety, uh, uh, yeah. Let's take some 72,000 BTU propane burners and put them on wooden pallets. <laughs> yeah! Inside of your garage. No carbon monoxide issue there. Exactly. Why am I so sleepy? Uh-huh. <laughs> Is it the beer or the carbon monoxide? <laughs> a little bit of both. All right, so this is, well, it's certainly a creative home rig, you know, that somebody has come up with. I think I would at least coat it with something instead of just exposed wood, you know. I'd get, I'd get some of that deck solution that, you know, is like, it's like rhino lining. Have you seen that at Home Depot? It goes on like paint, but it basically gives you a rhino liner on your deck. I think I would at least do that to the pallet before I lit a fire on it. So this one, you may not be able to see, but it, it was really good for the safety last caption. Um, so we've got, what's our laudering temperature? Um, it, it depends upon what you're trying to do. You're Greater than 100 degrees Fahrenheit? Absolutely. Generally about 165. So... We have 165 degrees, and that's probably about, what, four gallons, five gallons worth? Okay. Sitting on top of a little uh, wooden stand that is held on with little orange Home Depot clamps, which you may not see, that is sitting on top of a couple of sawhorses. So we're going to go from 165 degrees downwards, and it's all held together with a couple of wood clamps. Hence the caption. <laughs> oh, that's it, okay. Invisible tire, fire retardant paint. <laughs> but at least they moved it outside of the house. At least it's outside of the, at least it's outside, there's a car here, so they're in the driveway. Yeah, so. Easier access for the paramedics when, when they come in. <laughs> Exactly. Speaking of which, I think we need to give away some more. No more freebies, no more freebies for him? You know, we, we didn't really think this through. We didn't come up with trivia questions. We th figured we'd do it on the fly. So, um, yeah. Who can tell me what's in my next slide? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> no, you lost. Yeah. <laughs> Childproof brewing. Yeah. No, we have an example of a good brewing rig, or at least more of a safe brewing rig. Now, take a look. It's, yes, we have a welder here. And in the center, we actually have pumps. So this is when you start getting into the really expensive stuff. So it's, it's pumping it throughout the various, okay, and that, yeah. So here's another good one. This one, they actually made a control panel. It's got, it's got blinky lights and dials. Well, but they also have an exhaust fan. They have an exhaust fan. I mean, they're smart. That's right. Okay, so that was the slides. What else did we want to? Recipes. So let's let's pull up some recipes real quick. Well, do, do one last thing. Pull up a, a more beer. I have to connect to the clarion here. Fermentation chamber. Tonic for fermentation. Put that bad little. Yeah. Go ahead. Right. 
and real horse sweat. That's why it's called equus. Right? Okay. <laughs> well, I use champagne yeast to make the cider. I mean, Absolutely. There are other yeast yeah. that are not champagne yeast that, will, that are equally uh, high gravity or alcohol tolerant. Um, Belgian yeast are probably the most common for that. Und the ice block, yeah. Yeah. 130 proof beer? At that point, it would be liquor. Yeah, it's just. Yeah, it's, it's, it's. Just because something has more alcohol, it doesn't mean it's going to taste better. And a lot, and a lot of times, you're, you're better beers are going to have the lower alcohols or just because something has the most hops doesn't make it better oh. it lord yes uh, if it only has one dimension and that dimension's hops i'd give it four thumbs down if i had two more minutes. yeah so so here's the next trivia question who knows what the role of hops are in the uh, brewing process We might give you some more anyway, but who, 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 who that has not answered a question so far knows what the purpose of hops are? Not, not, even, not even getting into that level of detail. Just, what's the purpose of it? He kind of did, yeah. Yeah, okay, all right, come on up. So, so basically, so, so basically, the brewing process is you're going to make a big steaming pot of sugary goo and it's going to be super 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 sweet and you know how sweet and low or or any other of those artificial sweeteners if you put too much in it it just turns the flavor to just crazy hops are basically the counter to all of that sweetness hops are bitter so the more hops you add the more bitterness you're adding into your beer and if you don't offset it with more of the sweetness, then you're going to go way over into one particular flavor profile. They are a preservative, yes. That's why IPAs have a really high uh, hop, or uh, IBU, HBA, whatever, yeah. whatever yeah. your scale is. They've, mm -hmm. they've got a really high hop value to them. They're really bitter. It preserves things when they used to ship these they they had to send beer to their troops over in india the brits did and so what they did was they they were like hey what can we do to preserve our beer to get it to our boys over there hey if we just load this stuff full of hops you know it for some reason it, it seems to last and it's preserved and it doesn't go bad that's what we'll do hence ipa or india pale ale all right so we were talking about how if you, if you thought that brewing your own beer would be a good way to cut back in price. So, you know, here's what a seven and a half gallon conical fermenter, heated and cooled, so this is one that'll control your temperature pretty much exactly. Give a zoom on this one. Let's see if I get it to back. Oh, yeah. So. Oh, yeah. Keep both of your hands above the table. sexy well it depends on which method you use so if you're going with the mr. beer method you need about 15 minutes <laughs> if you're going to do an extract kit um, typically and, and it all depends on the equipment that you have so think about this is a public network this is not a home network yeah, so, um, you know, the upgrades that I have done to my system have been in the burners that I have purchased because I have one of those nice smooth glass top stoves. And if you've ever tried to take two and a half gallons of tap water up to boiling or to the 165 degree 
stew, uh, steeping point, um, it'll take an hour and a half <laughs> to get up there on high. So I've now got a, that's a good stove. And, and so I now have a propane burner that has um, concentric circles and lots of nice little ports on it. And it'll take four gallons of ice, almost ice cold water up to boiling in three and a half minutes. It's roughly half the heat of the sun. <laughs> and, you know, that was a really good investment because it cut down on my time that I needed to do my, to do my brew sessions. But um, you're, <laughs> it's <laughs> real quick. So typically, once you get to 160, 160 165 degrees, you'll steep it for about 20 minutes. And then after that, so you, you put in your specialty grains, you put them in a... a a bag and you, you let them steep, kind of like kind of like making tea. It's really what what it's like. Um, and then once you finish the steeping, you pull the grains out and then you get it up to boiling as fast as you can. And again, I can do that really fast with my fancy new burner. Um, and then you're going to boil it typically for right around an hour. And then you have to cool it down to room temperature. So I have not invested in that next step, which is a wort chiller which will let you go from really hot to room temperature very quickly. Um, now, if you are a fan of Alton Brown, um, you may have seen him do something that is absolutely ludicrous, which is to put bagged ice directly or to chill it down. <laughs> yeah, and, and yeah, anybody who has done any serious amount of, of home brewing would kick him in the nuts um, if they saw him, you know. So, well, I mean, you're going to add water to it anyway, but what you've just done is, is you've just added pretty much, I mean, the ice that you get out of bags, it may have been filtered a little bit, but it's just not, uh, yeah. Oh, no, he opens up the bag of ice, and he puts it into the wort directly. So your, your sanitation, yeah, so who knows what other microbes have been added into your wort. Um, so what I do is I'll take... Yeah, yeah. So I'll, so I'll take the sink and I will um, empty out my ice tray into the sink and I'll put my brew pot into the ice and then I'll fill it up with some cold water and that helps to decrease it a little more rapidly than just sitting around. Um, but yeah, you can get a work chiller which is basically a um, uh, copper tubing that's you know, in circles and it goes down into the pot and you hook it up into the um, uh, tap on your sink and turn the cold water on, and it just keeps circulating cold water through, and it, it acts as a heat exchanger. Or, or you can use a counterflow chiller. I suggest running a uh, two or three gallons of boiling water through it after you've used it. Um, I was about to say, I have, I have a counterflow chiller. It's known as a Chillzilla. And basically... Um, the way I run mine is I'll have a couple bags of ice over in a five-gallon bucket, and there's another little apparatus that the water goes through and it gets cold in that. Then that comes out, it comes in, it's going. You, you have basically one tube that, that comes out here that's bigger, and you have another one that comes up. You're running cold water in the outside. You're running your wort from the top down inside, right? Correct? Okay. Um, you know, so good old physics problem there, right? Heat rises, what's cold want to do? It wants to go down. Um, so we're running it like this, and I'm also pre-chilling my water before I push it up through the counterflow chiller. I can literally sit there and take, uh, run stuff through here, and as long as I regulate the speed at which I push my wort through my counterflow chiller, I can drop it down into a glass carboy at 75 degrees from boiling. Um, by running it through a counterflow chiller. And I really did that because I got tired of the amount of time it took to do the whole bag of ice thing to, to chill my, um, I have a 10 gallon pot, so that's, you know, it's bigger and it takes more ice and you gotta have a bigger thing to put it in with all the ice, et cetera. I got tired of buying so much ice and I got tired of the time. And um, you know, when you've already put in six or seven hours on a, on a all grain batch, that extra hour, two hours at the end of it, that's worth a lot if you can cut that off. But yeah, run boiling water through it. Yeah, that's, that's where you tend to end up spending your money is in things that can save you time. 
in the whole brew process. Um, first you shave off the time and then you work on the consistency, I think. You had a question? That's good, but that's still too hot to, to pitch your yeast, right? And you want to get down. I mean, I'm literally, literally in the time that I'm running this through, and I'm going to say 15 to 20 minutes at the most, I have 75-degree work down here ready to pitch yeast immediately. 75 is fine. That, and you're talking 15 to 20 minutes, and I'm running it directly out of, I'm running it directly out of the pot, through the counter flow, right into a glass carboy. That quick. Trivia question, what happens if you pitch your yeast at too high of a temperature? You have a glass? So, yeast wants, well, does it actually die or does it just go back to sleep? Uh, it, yeah, it'll die. If you get it too cold, it'll go to sleep. And if you, if you get it too hot, you'll, you'll kill it off. Yeah. Could you watch it? <laughs> this is made out of PGA. Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. All right. Any other questions? You want to talk about geekiness factor on this for a minute? The geekiness factor. Yeah, you got your uh, fans built into it. You got the. <laughs> what that is? See the fan here, folks. Who's who's f uh, familiar with the Peltier effect? Or thermoelectric cooling (TEC). We've got a hand. We've got a hand in the back. Um, so what is that? That's sort of like an air conditioning plant on a chip, almost, right? We run a current one way. We pull some heat off. Do something like that. We can really cool the hell out of something. So what we've got here, we've got this hooked up to a, a, a microcontroller over here, on the left, and this is how we control our temperature within one degree of set temperature set using Peltier effect. You've got TEC devices around this, uh, depending upon the size and the efficiency of it and how they've set up the heat sinks and various things on the outside of this conical fermenter, you can do just crazy, crazy stuff with temperature control. And that is literally the biggest single, uh, single, single biggest thing that I can think of to make repeatable beer time after time after time after time that tastes the same way, that has the same profile, that does all these things. When this is done in a commercial brewery, what they have is they literally have glycol jackets around the fermenters that control this, do temperature control around it. That's uber, uber expensive, and of course we can't do that, but this is sort of like, um, I, I wouldn't even say Cadillac, I would say this is more... Uh, European. Jaguar. Audi. 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 There you I, I, I was going to say, I'm going to go German here, maybe, yeah, or if, if, if the Belgians had a car that matched that, I would go with them since they're sort of the Disney World of beer. But um, my, my grandmother and my great grandmother are both from Belgium, from the Flanders region. And um, I remember when I was five years old, my great grandmother pulled me over to the side one day when she was making beer at her house. I have no idea how she got ingredients for this back then because, you know, until the last, what, 10, 15 years ago, a lot of places in the U.S., it was really hard to get ingredients to homebrew with. It wasn't legal. She, she somehow had stuff to do it. And I went out one day and she had this gigantic pot going. And I said, Granny, what are you doing? She's like, Aaron, I am making beer, the bread of life. Aaron, come close. I want to tell you something very important. And I was like, what, Grandma? What is it? What is it? She says, Aaron, in Germany, beer is a way of life. But in Belgium, beer is the way of life. Never forget this. Don't tell Fred Schneerman from Bosco's. Well, the former brewmaster at Bosco's that. He's German. He hates to hear that. <laughs> All right. So um, I just thought of another trivia question here. Um, and then it completely escaped my mind. What's your name, Scott? It begins 
Um, let's see. Uh, 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 yep. T went off into the uh, old Belgian bit. You're welcome to think of something. We got a little bit left here. <laughs> because we're going back to the keg after this, so, you know, we can give this to whoever. Um, anybody have any more questions? Would anyone like to contribute money to help me buy one of these? <laughs> yeah, we'll take donations on this, that's for sure. Yeah, Kickstarter, yeah. I'll let you have a sample of my beer. <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. Oh, that goes to my... Tra so, can anyone tell me at what point... And what car or who made home brewing legal in the United States for the most part? Still illegal in some states, but who for the most part made it legal? Hey, hey, hey that's for our trivia trivia winner. <laughs> Greedy bastard. I made some questions up, but remember he made questions. He got the drink. Who made it legal? We're talking about, yeah, recent. It happened in the last 30 years. President Jimmy Carter, who banned drinking in the White House, was actually one of those rare individuals that thought that just because it's not the choice I would make, it doesn't mean I should take away other people's choices. So, that's why he's no longer a politician, because he thought with his head. But, um, yeah, he signed a law that made it legal for people to brew up to, anybody know the answer, how many gallons? Five. No, it is not five gallons. So, it, it's an IRS exemption, because the people that will come after you are the... The revenueers. That's right. You can make up to 50 gallons of homebrew per adult in the household, up to a maximum of two adults. So each household can do 100 gallons per year. So that was basically Jimmy Carter's. So, Dink, would you like? Drink, Dink. Uh huh, yeah. Yes. So they give you an extra, well, but, but, so that's a state regulation, but the federal is still based on IRS, so. Huh? Oh, no, we're, we're done. We're done. Yeah, we're done. Yeah. All right. So this pretty much concludes our homebrew roundtable. Do we have the technology access center people in here? Are they here yet? Oh, you're one of them. Oh, okay. Is, I think. The Kims is who was supposed to be showing up? Are they here? Okay, okay. All right, because I'm going to introduce you guys next. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll take five. And then. Thank you. <laughs>